And I am, at the moment, utterly steeped in climate change. Over the years, I started off very broadly on the environment, and indeed I, I still do report broadly, but as the years have gone by, I've been drawn more and more and more to climate change as an issue because it's so fascinating. It just covers absolutely everything. And emissions are being produced from everywhere, from the, 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 the tribesperson on the Serengeti lighting a twig fire to the coal-fired power station on the Hudson River to, to you guys going home by your bus or even your tube, which we think of being a, a sort of a, a, the good option, but of course that produces carbon emissions too. And then the whole ad adaptation side, the equity side, who's going to suffer most, and when would they suffer, the, the whole uncertainty about the science. I find it absolutely, utterly compelling. And at the moment, I'm submerged by probably five times as many stories as I could possibly handle, especially as just as we're in the run-up to Paris, and I've been travelling recently to Malawi to, uh, to see a clay stove which you use to charge your phone while you're cooking your dinner, and to Morocco to see a giant... Uh, solar thermal array where they're using uh, solar power to melt salt and create molten salt which holds its energy in the final stage will hold its energy for up to eight hours after dark so they have the potential for powering their uh, electricity system in that part of Morocco for 20 hours a day by solar power alone. But all, while all of this stuff is going on, the government is busy dismantling its energy policy and keeps promising that it's going to come up with a new one, but hasn't yet. The latest intelligence I got on this yesterday was that it won't be next week, it will be the week after, so just coming up to Paris. But at the moment, because there's such turmoil in energy, investors have already been deterred. I met a, a man in... Uh, one of my African travels, Morocco, I think it was, Morocco, uh, who working for a Saudi company who just said, <coughs> who said oh, frankly, we wouldn't go near the UK at the moment uh, for investments in uh, any in, 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 in a alternative energy because there's such uncertainty of policy. And tomorrow, the World Energy Council will announce that it's downgraded the UK from its AAA rating on energy to AAB. So we're still a world leader, but there's just too much uncertainty on policy for the World Energy Council's point of view and not enough investment in renewables. So all of this is going on at the same time. So I frankly am stretched pretty thin. Um, I'm also doing three climate change documentaries. I'll give them a little plug. They had a bit of a plug on Radio 4 this morning. Uh, they're on the following Mondays at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock and 8 o'clock. The first one is on climate science. Where are we with the science? The second one is uh, climate solutions, which includes technology and sort of soft solutions. And the third one is where are we with the uh, politics? Because I think we're at a very big moment now in politics. And looking at the science, the trailer for this morning included an economist called Richard Toll, who's very much favoured by... Um, sceptics, if you like to call them that, contrarians, lukewarmers, as some of them call themselves at the moment, people who don't think that there will be a great increase in, in uh, the world's temperature, and that if we look at recent records, it suggests that the climate is less sensitive to warming and CO2 than we previously thought. And I asked Richard Toll um, if he thought we'd be able to stay within the two Celsius mark. And he said, no, 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 we're heading for three or four degrees in a very sort of insouciant way. And I said, well, you know, how are we going to cope with that? He said, yeah, Europe will cope. And, you know, I'm rich enough to cope and I'll make sure my children are rich enough to cope. So we had a discussion about what, what coping meant and his, his view was that we should just make countries as rich as possible so they can adapt to whatever uncertain changes might happen. Um, people living in those countries, those poor countries, might have a different view. Uh, there are also scientists in the UK working on what happens for Europe if we get a four-degree rise. And the truth is that a four-degree average rise for Europe leaves a two-degree rise on the west coast of Ireland, according to Met Office projections, but a rise of maybe six or seven degrees in Central Europe, particularly in the summer, which would be really, really problematic. It also melts an awful lot of Arctic ice, which already we believe, we're not sure, already scientists believe that the changes in Arctic sea ice are starting to affect weather patterns. So we can expect more, th more th uh, storms, more thunderstorms, more floods, um, more heat waves. And I mean, here's a little tip. If we're talking about adaptation, I think one area that hasn't been looked at 
is the problem with uh, new house building. There was a survey out recently, which I don't think got reported, of people who lived in new housing. And people living in new housing, i.e. properly insulated against the cold, were stiflingly hot in the heat. And that's something we need to look forward to when we're talking about adaptation. But let's suppose we get our few degrees of warming. We're not quite sure how many uh, degrees we're going to get. I mean, what, what should we be looking at in terms of resilience and adaptation? We're talking later about mitigation, but we're going to start off with adaptation. So where, where are our priorities? I mean, do we just say goodbye to the line from Machantleth um, to Tauen, for instance? That'd probably be a good idea. I mean, you get your feet wet when you're travelling by that train anyway, you know, and there's nowhere else for it to go. What do we do? Do we maybe set up a boat service from Mahantleth to Tawin? Probably that would be a good idea. Um, is that a priority? How much of a priority is it? And how do we measure that against other priorities? Seafront promenades, you know, they are badly affected by storm surges, and of course we are getting slowly increasing sea level rise. Storm surges will overtop those, uh, those rises. Maybe they can wait for a while. They're not going to get blown away, those, uh, those seafront houses yet. What about nuclear power stations? How resilient are they to, to changing climate? And what about the interlinking of systems? You know, are we going to see systems failing like they did in New York, for instance, uh, with Katrina, when the electricity went down and then the backup generators couldn't be started because they couldn't pump them out because there was no electricity to start the backup generators? And the World Energy Council is looking at a new, a new phrase now. Instead of fail-safe energy, they're calling it safe-to-fail energy. You know, do we need to be looking at that sort of thing as well to stop these domino effects? One thing is absolutely for certain that in this time of austerity, it would be absolutely rational to try to determine where we get the best bang for our buck. And I suspect that's not going to happen. I suspect political priorities may still prevail. So the year before last, for instance, or was it last year, that we had these dreadful floods on the Somerset levels, and my colleagues were saying, oh, look, you know, 25 square miles underwater. And I did thought, well, actually, that's five miles by five miles. If you think about the entire UK map, that's not a great deal, is it? And there were a lot of other areas underwater, but not so spectacularly so as a place where we could put up the helicopter and get the massive pictures every day of these little deserted stranded villages and the woman, the woman who had a dead badger and tampons floating in her living room or something. I can't remember the exact details, but it was roughly that. But I mean, horror stories and personal stories where we kept going back to these individuals in distress because television craves individual human stories. And as a result, the Somerset levels got a very hefty increase in spending. And a year later, I did an assessment of how that money had been spent and concluded, and nobody argued with this except for people in the Somerset levels, that the Somerset levels had had too much of the national pie. So we're going to need to think very carefully on how we get our value for money. <clears throat> 